I'm on, huh? Well, everybody, welcome to Black Friday Night Light. <laughs> uh, we are missing some people tonight, but I think it's probably because they're o overdosing on turkey and mashed potatoes and stuffing. Well, it could be shopping, yeah, yeah. But that's, that excuse is unacceptable. <laughs> now, over, overdosing on turkey, yeah, I can understand that. You're probably taking a nap. <laughs> but I'm glad that we're all here. I, you know, I'm glad to be here. And I'm glad that we're getting into the Word of God tonight. So why don't we dis, just pray, okay? Father, we thank you tonight for your goodness to us. We thank you for your mercy. And we do have so much to be thankful for, Lord God, that... We need to re reflect back like, like David as he sat down before the Lord and said, Who am I and what is my house that you've brought me this far as he was sitting in a palace? And now you're talking about building a royal dynasty, the Messiah coming from me. Lord, we have the same kinds of things. Maybe not we're, we're not sitting in a palace, but you have taken care of us and established our households. And Lord, you talk about a future for us that will last for all of eternity. And our inheritance cannot fade away, cannot be stolen. Uh, so Lord, we just thank you tonight. We have much to be thankful for. And so Lord, as we come together tonight, I do pray that your spirit would abide with us tonight. Your spirit would guide us through your word as we... Get into it, Lord, and that you would speak to our hearts the things that we need to hear. Open our ears, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Acts chapter 20. You remember last week, uh, I went a uh, total of like two and a half verses. Okay, Paul is on his third missionary journey. And uh, you're going to see a map later on during this uh, study hopefully unless the spirit changes direction or something uh, but you will see a map uh, and the directions that he has gone he ended up getting to Ephesus where he stayed for quite a long time some years and then from that point he wanted to go back over to Macedonia that's northern Greece and then and then and then he wanted to make his way back again. That's what we're reading tonight. And last week we spent some time because he, there, there was more than one reason why he went over to Macedonia. You remember uh, there was an uproar in Ephesus and he left that after, after things settled down. He went to Macedonia and he was there to encourage the churches that had be, begun there. To go back and encourage. That was his heart. But there was something else that he was doing, too. And I'm going to test you guys tonight. Do you remember what else he was doing? Offerings. Collecting offerings from the churches there. Yes. For the, churches in, for the church in Jerusalem, the church, church in Jerusalem was uh, very poor. And so he was, uh, uh, and we, talked about, we talked about giving. And how we give to the Lord and our attitude. And uh, so that's what we did last week. But uh, he's, we're moving on this week. Okay, so let me again start in verse 1 of chapter 20. It says, After the uproar had ceased, Paul called the disciples to himself, embraced them, and departed to go to Macedonia. Now when he had gone over that region and encouraged them with many words, he came to Greece. And stayed three months. Okay? And that's where we left off last week. And when the Jews plotted against him as he was about to sail to Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. So, uh, again, later on, you'll see a map. And you'll see where Syria is. Syria is north of uh, Jerusalem, north of Israel, okay? So he wanted to come back, and he's going to make his way back to Jerusalem eventually. So, But it says he was going to sail to Syria. That was his plan, right? But somehow he found out that there was a plot against his life. No, really? 
a plot against the life of Paul? Well, if, if it's not your time to go, it's not your time to go. And your plots, the plots against your life, uh, well, they'll be found out. And so obviously that's what happened here. I don't have to dwell on that too much. So he decided to go back through Macedonia. So if you saw the map again, up from uh, uh, Corinth, he went back up into the area of Macedonia and then starts to sail back over to Ephesus area and he's going to go that way, okay? Uh, because there was a plot on his life. Now, the other thing is, is it's possible, okay, the Lord allows a plot on your life so that you change directions and go the direction you want, that he wants you to go for other reasons that become evident after that. So, you ever been in that situation? Yeah. But that does happen. Uh, we don't know if that's what happened here, but, uh, you know, it's nice. It, it goes on, verse 4, and it mentions a bunch of guys that are accompanying him. It says, Sopater of Berea accompanied him to Asia, also Aristarchus and Secundus of the Thessalonians, and Gaius of Derby and Timothy and Tychicus and Trophimus of Asia. All familiar names to you, right? <laughs> well, they are mentioned, a lot of these names in other letters of his. They are uh, brothers, and they're accompanying him. Maybe, you know, their safety in numbers. You know, uh, if you got a guy on each side and they're, they're guarding you while you sleep. Somebody else that wanted to throw you overboard is not going to be able to get to you too easy, right? But anyways, he's got friends to accompany him. It's always good to have friends on a trip, isn't it? It says, these men going ahead waited for us at Troas. Now, now that gives us a little picture here. Who's writing this, this account? Luke. Well, he's back with Paul because he says he refers to us. Okay, these men going ahead waited for us at Troas. Like I said, we'll we'll see the map, and so other otherwise these these names of cities and places are are probably you know foreign to you. These men going ahead waited for us at Troas. Luke is writing this. But we sailed from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread and in five days joined them at Troas where we stayed seven days. Now on the first day of the week, which day is that? Sunday. Good answer. Paying attention back there. When the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued <coughs> his message until midnight. <laughs> you know, usually uh, on Friday nights, I look at the clock. I, you're probably grateful that I have a clock that I can see. Keep my eye on the time. You know, 40 minutes, 45, something like that. And I, I have seen people, not too much anymore in this church, but looking at their watch like, hey, it's time to go. Can you imagine midnight? Okay, open your Bibles. We're going to do the entire book of Revelation tonight. <laughs> Just be glad it, we're not going to do Psalm 119. <laughs> he spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered together. What kind of lamps do you think they were? Oil, Oil lamps. Right. What happens with oil lamps? Well, they run out, yeah. But I can tell you, because I was an rg and &E man for years, and I responded to carbon monoxide calls. Yeah. Candles. Some people like to light a lot of candles, and they wonder why their CO detector goes off. Thanksgiving was one of our busiest times. I, I loved working Thanksgiving. My wife would make up a plate for me, and I had a microwave in my truck, so I was okay. But uh, all day long, people's CO detectors were going off. Wonder why? 
cooking turkeys in an oven or pies. So I would get there and I would determine, yeah, you need to crack a window. What kind of pie do you got? <laughs> it was a lot of fun. But oil lamps, carbon monoxide, you wonder what happens next. In a window sat a certain young man named Eutychus who was sinking into a deep sleep. Now, it says a deep sleep. I don't know if it's overcome with carbon monoxide or not, but I'm just thinking again, it's con contributing, you know. He's in the window. Yeah, they didn't have window panes. <laughs> yeah. So he's sitting in the window he was overcome by sleep, and as Paul continued speaking, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. He fell three stories, and he was dead. But Paul went down, fell on him, and embracing him said, Do not trouble yourselves, for his life is in him. Now when he had come up and had broken Read and eaten and talked a long while, even till daybreak he departed. And they brought the young man in alive, and they were not a little comforted. <laughs> so you see this little uh, picture that we get of a, a Bible study that goes on and on and on forever and ever and ever. Uh, you, you know, we are a little bit spoiled in America. <clears throat> we can't take it if it goes too long. Now, I have been listening to people before where you could tell that they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and man, they could have talked all night long, as far as I'm concerned. But you got to realize that we have been trained, you know, we have um, a short attention span. We do have distractions. Yes, yes, distractions abound. But in other cultures in the world, in Africa, so say, a missionary is speaking in a certain village, people will walk for miles and miles and miles, whole families. They'll walk for miles to listen to this man. Can you imagine if after 45 minutes he said, okay, I'm done. They would be there all day. They expect more. And I remember hearing of uh, my uh, pastor, my, a friend of mine that uh, went to India. And said, those people, they would sit outside in the cold and listen all day. They would bear discomfort. But they just wanted to hear the word of God. You know? Pardon? Yeah, yeah, so, you know, I just kind of look at us sometimes, we're, we're kind of wimpy. <laughs> uh, they're hungry to hear the word of God, you know, and I have to feel like these people were saying, this is the Apostle Paul, this is, this is Paul, we got to hear this guy, you know, and they were hanging on his every word. Well, this young man well, he was overcome by sleep. And uh, you, I, I would never fall anybody for falling asleep, especially a person that works all day and comes out at nighttime, gets their family to church after working all day, and comes here and has a tough time. Their eyes are rolling, you know. I'm okay with that. I understand it. I, I've been there. It's easy to understand. So this young man, who knows? Maybe he was cutting wood all day long. And now he's sawing Z's. <laughs> well, at any rate, the Lord, the Lord shows up and brings this young man back to life. Another unusual miracle done through the hands of Paul by the Lord himself. Paul did not give this young man's life back did he no no there's only one who can do that but imagine you know if you were there at that bible study and it was getting towards midnight and you were thinking i need to get home and you know get to bed or something you know i got things to do tomorrow 
uh, after this event, how long did he speak? After that? Till daybreak. All of a sudden, the sun's coming up. <laughs> Till daybreak. Now that is Bible study. But they were, these people that were there, they were, it says in my Bible, not a little comforted by this young man <laughs> regaining his life. So we have this little instance here that Luke writes to us and reminds us. But let's go on. Then we went ahead to the ship and sailed to Assos. They're intending to take Paul on board, for so he had given orders, intending himself to go on foot. So, Becky, if you might put that map up there and we could see what's going on here. We'll see, see if we can find. There it is. Thank you. Can everybody see that? Okay, you can see that originally he started over in Ephesus. He made his way over to Philippi, back down to Athens, Corinth area, and then decided, no, I'm not going to sail over to Syria because somebody's plotting my life. He decides to go back up, up to Philippi, and he sails. You, you see all these these names here, and we're here at, at Assos, right? And it says here, we took him on board because he, he had gotten out to walk. It was, a, it, was a, it was just as fast to walk, and he wanted to. Sometimes it's good to take a walk. You know, hey, I'll meet you guys. You take the ship, I'll walk. Okay? We took him on board and came to Mytilene. We sailed from there, and the next day came opposite Chios. The following day, we arrived at Samos and stayed at Trogilium. The next day we came to Miletus. So where's that map? <laughs> okay, see, he's coming down. All these things he mentions. There's Miletus, Trogilium. Just so you guys get an idea, you know? When you read these things in the Bible, you don't think about them. But this is the way they went. And you're going to see eventually, we're not going to get there tonight, but he's going to make his way to Jerusalem. Okay, so thanks, Becky, for the map. We'll go on. Paul had decided to sail, sail past Ephesus so that he would not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hurrying to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. So he had a goal. I want to get to Jerusalem. I want to be there by Pentecost. If I go to Ephesus... I spent so much time there. I got so many people there that love me and they, they, they'll want to talk to me. I can't take the time. I need, to, I need to move on. Okay? So he said, I want to sail past Ephesus. Then it says, from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. So he sent a message to Ephesus, to the church at Ephesus, to the elders and said, hey, come down and meet with me. I'll talk to you, okay, just the elders, okay? Verse 18, and when they had come to him, he said to them, you know from the first day that I came to Asia in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. How I kept back nothing that was helpful but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. So let me just stop right there, review a little bit there. He's got the elders of the church at Ephesus. They're meeting together with him. He begins the conversation, starts speaking of, you guys know me, you know my heart, my attitude, the way that I lived among you. I wasn't seeking anybody's gold or silver or anything like that. He's going to say that. He, you can tell what kind of a person I was among you. You knew the message that I was preaching to you. I was doing it publicly. And 
from house to house. Home Bible studies and publicly in church or in synagogue, wherever he got a chance to speak. And it says here in verse 19, that he served the Lord with all humility and with many tears and trials. <laughs> you know, if you read, I think it's 2 Corinthians, he lists some of those trials that he went through. You know, I don't know how many times he was flogged or how many times he was, it says, in the deep. Can you imagine floating around in the Mediterranean Sea for any amount of time? Yeah. Yeah, plotting of the Jews. Yeah. He loves his brethren. If you ever read, read Romans, uh, I believe it's chapter 11, he said, I would give my own salvation for my brethren. And this is the way they treat him, you know. Plotting of the Jews. But again, he's speaking to these elders and now it says in verse 22, And see, now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem. Have you ever been bound in the Spirit? I, I can't say that I have. Maybe I have and I just didn't know it. Yeah. Well, Paul describes it that way, bound in the Spirit. That kind of sounds like the Spirit's leading the way. And... It may not be a way that you would really sign up for. You know? That you and I would sign up for. And he says, I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. <laughs> okay okay I'm asking for volunteers to go on a mission trip anybody want to go on a mission trip yeah we're going to go to some great places oh yeah sign me up pastor sign me up okay what's it going to be like well there's going to be chains <laughs> and tribulations uh -huh. I'll take my name off the list that's what he says every place I go He's having it confirmed to him that chains and tribulations. Oh, man, didn't I just give you a scripture last week, you know, in the message? Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you. <laughs> How does it go? Uh, not for pl thoughts of evil, but of a future and a hope. Not for evil. Well, I guess people who stand on those kinds of scriptures all the time don't like this one. Because there are times when the Lord says, no. I mean, what did he say to Peter? He's going to say it. We'll, we'll get there in a few weeks in John chapter 21. Peter, feed my sheep. Do you love me more than these? Feed my sheep. You know, when you grow older, they're going to lead you to a place that you don't want to go. And they're going to crucify you. Just telling you. So you know. Just preparing you. But Paul is saying to these guys, the Holy Spirit's telling me that I have to go to Jerusalem, that I'm going to Jerusalem, and my future, in my future are chains and tribulations. Hardships. But... And we're going to finish at this verse, but we're not finished by a long shot. But none of these things move me. Nor do I count my life dear to myself. So that I may finish my race with joy. And the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of of the grace of God. That is a meaty verse right there. This shows us Paul's heart and his attitude. None of these things. These what things? 
the things that he's hearing from the Holy Spirit. Chains, tribulations, that's your future. They don't move him. He said, I don't even count my life dear to myself. And that's really what you got to come to for this attitude. Giving up your own life. Do you ever give up your own life? Did Paul give up his life? Really? He did lose his head, right? Eventually. Well, where is he today? Yeah. Where is he today? That's it. So you don't lose anything. You don't lose anything. But he says, I don't count my life dear to myself so that I may finish my race with joy. Just see that. How is he going to finish it? Well, how is it going to finish? Joy. joy. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I ran a marathon when I was 30. I finished. But I did not finish with joy. I was like, <laughs> but he wants to finish with joy. You know, the joy of the Lord. And it mentions here, the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus. And the ministry is to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. I'm just going to ask you tonight, is your ministry any different from his? Is your ministry any different from Paul's? No. No. Because your ministry is the same. To testify to the gospel of the grace of God. He sent us all. To do this. It may not be in Ephesus. Or in Philippi. Or Berea. Or Athens. You may not be taking world's missions trips. But. He does. Send us. We do have a ministry. And that is to testify. Of the gospel of. Of the grace of God. Notice what kind of a gospel it is. What kind of a gospel is it? Of grace. A gospel of the grace of God. Not the wrath of God. Not that God's angry. It's God's goodness that leads us to repentance. It's his kindness. That appeared. And so we're supposed to testify of God's goodness. Of his grace towards us. Through, through the Lord Jesus Christ. But I just kind of want to spend a little time. On, on this, this attitude. On the wall. You're going to see a, a verse. Philippians chapter 3. Verses 7 and 8. Maybe you'll recognize this is again Paul. He's writing to the Philippians. He's writing from a jail cell. He says. What things were gained to me. These I have counted loss. For Christ. Previously, in the previous verses of chapter 3, he was talking about, yeah, I was born, you know, Jewish from the tribe of Benjamin, a Pharisee of Pharisees. He had the, what do they call that? It's escaping my, yeah, pedigree. That's the one I was looking for. I, he had the pedigree. And he had the degrees, okay? He was something. But he lost it all, didn't he? He says, what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet, indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. If you have a King James, it might say dung. I count them as dung, rubbish. That I may gain Christ. And so that was his attitude. Holy Spirit says uh, you're going to Jerusalem. And ahead of you is chains and tribulations. I'm okay with that. He's also going to get a beach house for a couple years. He doesn't know that. <laughs> and, and as we get into these chapters. We're going to see this roll out. Okay, and there's always questions about this. Because you're going to see. We're not going to see it tonight, but we're going to see it later on where there's going to be a prophet that comes, hey, you know, 
don't go. They're all saying, don't go, don't go, don't go. You got to go. So the question always is, well, was the Lord trying to tell him to stop? He was compelled, yes. He, he, loved, he loved his brethren and wanted, to, wanted them to be saved. Well, anyways, it reminds me, you know, these verses where he says, I have to finish my course. I have to finish my course. It reminds me that Jesus said in John chapter 4, and this isn't going to be on the wall. John chapter 4. Anybody remember what John chapter 4 starts out with? Just, you know, just, just going to put it out there. I must go through Samaria. Why did he have to go through Samaria? There was a woman at a well. What kind of woman? Samaritan woman. Oh, we don't go through Samaria. We go around Samaria. Well, Jesus said, I must need. Now, we don't have to go through the whole account of John, John chapter 4, but I will tell you, as his disciples came back from, from the town to get something, bring him something to eat, they said, eat, Master, eat. He said, my food mm -hmm. is to do the will of my Father. <clears throat> Excuse me. And what? Finish his work. Finish his work. Paul was the same. I need to finish his work. You remember in the Gospels where Jesus tells a little parable? about a king that's leaving and uh, he gave ser servants 10 minus, one mina apiece. He said, he said something to him. He said, occupy. You know what that word occupy means? Do business until I come. We're supposed to do business until he comes. We could go on all night with this. You know, but we each of us has a ministry. As I said, we have the same ministry as Paul in that we're supposed to testify of the gospel of the grace of God to everybody. everybody. Are we the Apostle Paul? No. Are we all pastors, teachers? No. But the next verse on the wall, Ephesians 2.10, you'll maybe recognize this Paul writes this too we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for what for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them now this is not for salvation the previous two verses before this verse tell you how you get saved by his grace and by faith but after we're saved we got work to do but he doesn't want you to do it alone he wants you to do it with him we are you are his workmanship and you were created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them so if you haven't already you should know you, you should have a little bit of an idea of what God made you for to bring him glory. It could be quite a few things. But you should be walking in those things. And finishing the work. Finish. That's it right there. Finish. Paul, Paul wanted to finish the race. His course. Jesus wanted to finish what God gave him to do. And we need to have that same attitude of having, the, we want to finish well. I've said it to the Lord, I want to finish with a kick. I didn't think about it until I got here earlier tonight. I remember, I, I would have had Becky post this if she could have uh, uh, from YouTube. You can look it up on YouTube if you like. It's only two, two to three minutes long. But if you uh, search for a girl called, her name is Heather Dornadin. Heather Dornadin. I'll spell that out for you. I'll write it out for you if you guys want, to, want me to. Heather Dornadin. 
back, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago, she was in college and she was a long, she was a, a runner, okay? And she was running a race. It was like a 600 meter race, which is like three laps around the track. And she was favored to win. There, there are like six or seven girls running in this race. And there's two or three teammates. And then there's the other team. Well, she's out ahead. Uh, she's favored. She's, and I've seen this. I've showed this to my granddaughters. You know, they, she's out ahead of everybody. And then I think she, with, with like a, a lap to go, what happens? She trips and falls. And everybody passes her by. Everybody passes her by. What'd she do? She got, she got up, started to run. I mean, she's got some ground because they were moving. And you could see her. She's just catching, catching the last one, catching the second to last one. It comes to the finish line, and she edges out the, the first one and wins the race. <laughs> wins the race. That's the attitude. That's the attitude. Trials, tribulations, chains, hardships. Paul was like, I'm going to finish. I'm going to finish. We should have that too. Philippians 3.12 on the wall. <clears throat> Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. What did Jesus Christ lay hold of Paul for? To go to the Gentiles, to go to the Jews, to share the gospel. To, I'm sending you. Bring them from darkness to light. From the power of Satan to God. And he hasn't perfected it yet. I have not apprehended. I have not attained that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus laid hold of me. He's, he knows what he's supposed to do and he keeps doing it. In the next verse, chapter, or verse 13. <clears throat> Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. You know, runners don't look back. If they look back, they will lose ground. One of the enemy's strategies is for to get us to look back. I mean, when we look back and give thanks for something, that's one thing. But don't stay there. But he wants us to look back and say, yeah, you're a failure. You didn't do this right. You didn't do that right. God, you know, all, he uses all kinds of things. But he wants us to look back. Paul says, I'm not. I forget about what's behind me. And I look forward to what's ahead. And then verse 14, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. He's pressing on. Pressing on. I'm going to finish. I'm going to finish. <clears throat> the next verse, 1 Corinthians 9, 24. He writes, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. Uh, there's definitely an attitude there, isn't there? Uh, it's like Heather Dornan did. I, I, I don't want second place. I, I don't want to, okay, I can just quit because everybody will understand that I fell. Uh-uh. No, none of that. I'm going to win. And she was running in such a way that she could obtain the prize. And that's what Paul says. That he wants for us. As he's finishing his life, he writes a letter to Timothy the sec in Second Timothy chapter four, verses seven and eight. He says, "I have fought the good fight. I have finished <clears throat> the race. I have kept the faith." Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous Judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but all, also to all who have loved his appearing. So I, I had to put that last one in there because 
there's a reward. Jesus says, I mean, it, it says it in Isaiah 40. He, his reward is with him. He's got a reward. But the first verse I read, verse 7, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now, we are not competing with one another. We're not running against each other. Each one of us is running their, your own course. And, it, and all we are doing is encouraging one another to keep running, and to keep going, keep the faith. Edifying one another. We're all cheering each other on. Your course is different from my course. My course is different from Paul's course. But we all have a course to run. And there's a reward at the end of it. One more verse. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses... Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. You see, there's an awful lot there. We're surrounded by witnesses. He's probably referring to chapter 11, all these great people of faith before. Are they watching us? I don't know. But he's drawing a picture of the marathon as it finishes, it comes into the stadium, there's a crowd there, right? And there's people watching. And maybe we're just surrounding, watching each other. And we're witnessing. It tells us to lay aside every weight. You, you need to lose weight. <laughs> you don't see runners wearing backpacks. <laughs> Front packs. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Sin, which so easily ensnares us. So there's besetting. It's called in King James, besetting sins. That, that take us out of the race. You know? It's like tripping up. You need to get back up. And it says, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And this race is not a sprint. It's not even a 600 meter race. Three laps. Oh no. It's much longer. And so you're going to need endurance. And how do you get endurance? By verse 2. Looking unto Jesus. Looking unto Jesus. He's actually the prize. He's actually the finish line. Looking unto Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. And it says, the author and finisher, finisher of our faith. Did you ever think of that way? You, you know, your life is a book. You know, that's being written. Who's the author? Jesus is the author. He's going to finish the book, isn't he? The book on Ira. Yeah, he's going to complete it. That's, it. That's what the per perfect means, complete. Yes, it's going to be completed. And he's, he's the one that's writing it, if you're looking unto him. Yep. And then the writer of Hebrews finishes that verse with, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. It was a joy for the Lord to go to the cross. Why? Because of you. You're his joy. He despised the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He finished. He said, it is finished. In his prayer, in a high priestly prayer in John 17, Father, I have finished the work that you gave me to do. And we should be saying the same thing. What kind, of, what kind of work do you have for me to do? What kind of calling is there? What kind of gift that, did you give me that I need, to be, I need to be doing it? And I need to be believing you for the strength to do it. And I actually want to do it with you. I don't want to, 
I can't do it without you. And Jesus says that in John 15, right? Without me, you can do nothing. So don't say, I can't. Just say, I will. Say, I will. Who strengthens me? Yeah. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. We thank you for the Apostle Paul, that he, he, he is an example to us, Lord God. We, he, he started talking to the Ephesian elders, Lord, about knowing they, they knew what kind of life he led and what kind of person he was and what kind of character. And we get that same picture tonight, Lord. He wasn't fin- quitting for anything, was he, Lord? And he wasn't afraid and he wasn't, you know, there was all kinds of, Things being said uh, about his future going to be filled with jails. And, and we know that to be true. But that didn't stop him, Lord. That did not stop him. And so, Lord, help us to have a little bit of that attitude, Lord. Help us to know what we're supposed to be doing. And help us to do it, Lord. And help us to have the attitude that we want to finish the race. And we want to finish it with joy. We thank you tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.